Hey guys, welcome back to the RMX250 build. In this episode, I'll be completely rebuilding the RMX250 engine and hopefully giving you guys as much information as I can along the way so that you can use this as a guide to rebuild your own engine. Now keep in mind for those who are watching this video and haven't watched the rest of my series, uh, the RMX I have is a 1999 RMX250S, which is an Australian model. It's the same as the 1998 and 2000 models that Australia received. Uh, so it won't be exactly the same as the rest of the world. But most two strokes are very similar, so this will serve as a good guide anyway. These are all the bearings I'll be needing to rebuild the RMX. For those interested and those also rebuilding their RMX and are looking to save some money, stick around for a second. If not, you can just skip ahead because there's going to be some boring bearing information. So I managed to find all the bearings I need from the bearing store, saving a lot of money just reading the part numbers off the bearings that were in the cases, with the exception of these two bearings, which are Suzuki specific. They are made by NTN, as a lot of the other bearings in the RMX were, but only Suzuki was allowed to sell these bearings. This bearing is discontinued from Suzuki, and I was actually able to find a few using the NTN part number on eBay in Italy. They were about $80 shipped to Australia, but I also found one in Queensland at a Suzuki dealer using this part number. This bearing is still available, and that's the part number for it. You cannot buy this bearing from a bearing store, it has to be from Suzuki because it is Suzuki specific. The stock shift drum bearing is an IKO bearing, but I was able to find a quality equivalent made in Germany. Most of the gearbox bearings are NTN, so I was able to find replacements for those. The stock crank bearing is a Nachi bearing in the RMX, and I was able to get equivalent Koyo bearings. These are the water pump bearings, and these are the power valve bearings. In the case of the water pump bearings, and this bearing here, from factory, it only has one metal shield on it, so, this replacement bearing has two metal shields on it, so I'll have to pop that off. And these bearings, although they do come in unsealed, they didn't stock them in Australia. So I'll just pop these seals off and then it's exactly the same. Full disclosure, I just looked up how much I paid for each of these. Um, so the discontinued bearing is 85. The Suzuki bearing was 42. Uh, all these bearings here were 88 and the crank bearings were 54. So that was a total of $269. Uh, if I had bought all these bearings from Suzuki, that probably would have been more like 600. So I have my engine cases sitting on the workbench ready to go. I'm gonna pop these three engine cases in the oven at 200 degrees for half an hour to expand them. And I've put the bearings in the freezer and I left them there overnight to shrink them. And then once these are done heating up in the oven, the bearing should just slip right in with very minimal effort. I got the cases and the side cover and a lot of the other engine parts vapor honed, so these basically look brand new. But keep in mind that if you get your stuff vapor honed, when you get them back to your house, you need to wash them with warm soapy water and maybe blow over them with some compressed air because the little glass beads that is in the media can sometimes like statically charge to the cases. So you need to thoroughly wash them before you reassemble your engine. This stuff came out really nice though, and I'm super impressed with uh, how these look. All the bearings are now in the cases and as you might have seen from the footage most of them just slip straight in others just need a little tap from the end of the hammer just to get down to the bottom using an appropriately sized socket helps a lot when you're installing these smaller ones these are definitely a little bit harder to install than the bigger bearings the bigger bearings generally just fall straight in but these smaller ones uh it's a little bit easier just to grab a socket that's the right size the outside diameter of that bearing and just tap it in so you can tap it in square 
it's really hard to mess up where these bearings go because they're all different sizes. So if it fits in the hole, that's most likely where it goes. The only thing you have to make sure is that you put this one that is uh, the half sealed bearing the right way around. So when you're installing this bearing, because you install it from this side of the case, you want to have that sealed side facing down. And another thing that I do, mainly because that's how the bearings were before I pulled them out, is put all the bearings in so that their part numbers are facing towards the person who is installing them. Now it's time to do all the bearing retainers and I put those on using blue Loctite. The bearing stopper plates are installed. Uh, only the right side case has them. Uh, on the inside, there's one stopper plate for this bearing and the little cutout in the stopper plate goes towards the stop that's cast into the case and the same with the other side. Uh, two plates on this one, and the little notch in those plates goes towards the little post that's cast into the cases. I just got the crank back from the mechanic. Uh, it's been balanced and the big end and small end bearings been replaced and the rod has also been replaced. So that's ready to go. So I'm gonna put the crank in the freezer, same idea, uh, just to shrink the crank a little bit. And I'm gonna heat the cases up with a heat gun. I've just put some two stroke oil on the bearings because once I put the crank in, I won't be able to put oil directly on that bearing. So the crank went in nice and easy, and I should mention before you throw the crank in the freezer, might as well spray it down with WD-40 so that when that hot uh, meets the cold, there's no real condensation forming, so you don't want condensation all over your freshly rebuilt crank. The bearings came kind of like pre-oiled anyway, but because this was like a second-hand crank, that was rebuilt. Uh, it doesn't come covered in oil because it's not brand new. So just spray it with WD-40 or oil or something just to stop uh, getting some surface rust. Now it's time to put the gearbox gears in. Uh, it's pretty simple. And if you have trouble remembering where these go, this is where the clutch basket goes onto. So that would be facing up if I'm on the left side crankcase. And this is where the front sprocket would go. So that would protrude from the outside of the case on the left side. So you can see the gears actually need to be like this. Um, if you get confused, uh, especially if when you pulled these out, if you dropped any of the washers or the, or the gears and you're confused as to where they go back together, just uh, use the parts schematic. Uh, I use Mick Hone's website. They've got parts schematics on there and I'll, I'll just show you a screenshot of one now uh, just to give you an idea of what you're looking at. And that can kind of tell you if you've got all the washers you need and if the gears are in the right spot and also the orientation of the gears on the gear shafts together. When I put my gears out of the cases, uh, I checked all the dogs, which is these square extrusions off these gears. Uh, they're called dogs and these can get worn out. So make sure they've got nice square edges on them, which uh, they, I've inspected them and they all look good. So, and when I pulled my gearbox out, I just put zip ties on the ends of the shafts so the gears can't slide off when I've got them in Ziploc bags. And before I put the transmission back in, I'll just put some oil on these bearings. I'm just using the same oil that I'm gonna fill the gearbox up with when I'm done. It can be a little tricky getting these both in together at the same time without dropping the washers, but it is possible. Uh, it's easier if you have an engine stand so you can do it on its side, but I don't have an engine stand I can do that with. I had a little difficulty just getting it to sit down. It was just basically going in like slightly crooked and one of the teeth was sitting on top of the other gear. So I got that all lined up and I had a few light taps on this one and then it all fell into place. Uh, you'll notice that when you spin these without the shift forks in, they actually bind up. Don't be afraid, it's just uh, one of these gears needs to be lifted up by the shift fork and then they can spin freely. So now I'll put the shift forks in and the shift drum. When installing the shift forks, you can put these in upside down, but it's pretty easy to know how it goes because you can see on this side, it's only got a groove for one shift fork. We need the pin on the shift fork facing towards the shift drum, which goes here. So we slide that in without the shaft. For this side, the fork with the offset goes on the bottom and obviously that pin points towards the shift drum. So I'll just use a pick to lift up that gear that it runs in. And the top one, uh, the fork is actually center and the pin point points towards the drum again. After you've got the shift forks where they need to be, 
it's good to just put them to the side momentarily. You might have to just lift up slightly just to put it to the side. Same with this bottom one here. Just lift that gear up slightly, put it as far to the side as you can so we can get the shift drum in. Uh, on the RMX, the shift, the shift drum has this plastic piece. We'll face that side down. And when that's fully seated, you can just swing the shift forks across and they should go in their notches. If they don't, just spin the drum a little bit until they fall into a groove. You might have to lift up on the forks again, just so you're actually able to spin the drum. All the posts that are on those shift forks are in their respective groove on the drum. So now I can put the shift fork shafts back in. Obviously the long one will go on the side with the two. Might just have to jiggle the forks around to get that to slide through. The same with the other side, just might have to jiggle the fork a little bit. Make sure that the make sure that the posts are still inside the shift drum. And if these went down all the way, they should be, and then they can't move out. And you can see that now the shift forks are in, that there's no binding in the gearbox, and everything rolls smoothly. So I'll just give you a closer look at everything. So hopefully this helps somebody. Uh, if you're wondering how to make sure that they're all, all the way down, if you look at the bottom gear, it should be very close to the case. It should be just uh, basically the thickness of the washer that was in front of that gear off the case. So you can see they're very close to the bottom of the case. That's how you know they're fully seated. So now I need to put the dowel pins in. There's one there and one there. Put the gasket on and then put the other side case on it. And we might as well put some oil on these gears, even though they're pretty oily anyway. But can't hurt. It's recommended by a few people to put anti-seize on these dowels, so that's what I'll do. I just put gloves on because I've heard this stuff is not good for you. And it also makes an absolute mess, so there's two reasons to wear gloves. I'm going to grease this gasket. Just so if these cases ever need to come apart, the gasket won't stick to the cases and it should be pretty easy to remove. And it also holds the gasket in place while you're connecting the two halves. If you're having trouble getting the gasket to stay where it is, just add a little bit of grease to the surface and it should stick. And you can see I've cut the gasket here. That's because this gets cut off once the other half of the case is on. So now I'm just making sure the gasket's stuck down everywhere it needs to be and it's not gonna move while I install the other half of the case. I'm gonna heat up this bearing and uh, hopefully that eases installation, putting this half on top. Now the two halves of this metal sandwich are together. You just need to be careful as you're putting the two halves together that the shift fork shafts are lining up with this hole and this hole, and you can see them. And if they're not lining up, you can just put a pick down in there and just wriggle until they do, and that the shift drum is lining up. These ones are pretty easy because they all pretty much go through the bearing at the same time. But you just need to make sure the shift fork shafts and the shift drum uh, line up with the holes they're going into. And then this thing with a few light taps, you can see I just use my hands, uh, all comes together. So now I need to flip this thing over and start putting case bolts in. I bought a bolt kit for a RM250 90 to 95. Uh, these engines are very similar and that's what the engine in this bike is based off. The chassis is based off a later model RM and the engine is an earlier RM. I know it's confusing, but if you just cross-reference things with photos and part numbers, then it's pretty easy to figure out. So hopefully all the bolts for the crankcase are the exact same and I'll get this thing bolted together. So all these zinc colored ones are the ones that came in the new bag that was labeled crankcase. And these are the old bolts that was in my bag labeled crankcase. And you can see there's a few extras. So the engines obviously have some differences. So I've just made sure they're all the same length, got the correct amount of bolts, and I'll show you where they all go. So it's pretty easy to figure out. Basically, if the bolt's in the right spot, when you drop it in, it'll have basically 10 mil from the underside of the bolt to the case. If it has any more, then it's not the right spot. For example, that's not the right spot. And I'll show you what it looks like if the bolt's too short. Too short. 
So it's pretty easy to figure out using this method. Otherwise, when you pull the engine apart, you lay it out, take a photo and write where they go. So you can see I've dropped all the bolts in. They're all just sitting there and they're all protruding 10 mil. So you know they're all in the right spot. Uh, the only exception is this one here because that is the case saver bolt. So when the front sprocket guard and case saver goes on, then that's where that bolt goes. So I'm not gonna do that right now. Now I need to tighten all these bolts diagonally. Uh, crisscross basically, so tighten this one, tighten this one, tighten this one, tighten this one, etc, etc. Uh, and the torque spec for these is 11 Newton meters. Now that all the case bolts are torqued, I can go around and trim back the excess gasket. And also don't forget to put your carburetor vent hose uh, guide hold the thing on like I did. But I'll probably have to end this episode here, otherwise this video will be like an hour long. Stay tuned for part two where I finish off the bottom end, including the stator and flywheel, uh, the clutch, primary drive gear, all the gear shifting mechanisms. And in part three I'll be covering the top end like the cylinder, piston and cylinder head and the power valve assembly. So if there's any more information you guys want to know, uh, leave me a comment down below. Otherwise like and subscribe for me. I'm almost at a thousand subscribers, which is awesome. I can't believe so many people enjoy the videos and I'll see you next time.